right, we're back at it. Another Monday. Why am I so big and not? Because you've been stuffing whatever that snack is on your face for the last 10 minutes. Well, this is because I'm eating pistachios because I'm on a 20 pounds in 20 days uh, loss thing. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll be eating muffins, okay? Does yeah. pistachios are good for you? Well, they're better than muffins. <laughs> <laughs> they don't taste better than muffins. Uh, well, they got a little salt on them, so. Um, they definitely don't taste better than muffins. But I can tell you this, uh, the um, that's that that's interesting. So I, I took off already five. It's I think I'm on day five. So, but I but I was down five in three days, and I kind of bumped up a pound, and then I got <laughs> back. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's starting to get hard. The first five are easy. Like two days, you just discipline yourself. Boom, five are gone. And then it's like, okay, now is your real challenge. Now, do you really want it? That's that's where it goes. But anyway, let's talk about let's talk about what's going on with our promo, man. Uh, MyFootballCamps.com uh, slash D1. Um, uh, I just did my, you know, Kruger video, actually, and uh, I hadn't taken a look at him since that first thing came through. Man, he's really good. Yeah, they don't target him a lot. Um, and that's J.J. Cole, the four-star quarterback who's going to Iowa State, his quarterback. Um he just in that offense, the tight end just doesn't get utilized that well. But he's a good blocker, inline kid, big, big kid, good size. Yeah. Um, and this is the thing, you know, <clears throat> we talk about. I watch the NFL a lot, and you always have the flex tight end, and you always have the blocking tight end, and you've never heard of the blocking tight end, you know, unless you get a guy like Gronk or you know Jason Witten or those guys who could. Do that. <laughs> um, you know, but the blocking tight end is extremely useful. And when I say blocking tight end, people think, oh, well, you know, he's just a sixth offensive lineman. He's not going to catch passes. No, it's the type of guy that can get downfield, uh, you know, box you out, get position, move the chains, you know, sneak by every once in a while, but also in line block. And that's what he can do. So to me, he's, he's, he's a five level kid um, and should be in that, that discussion. But the puzzling thing there is that his quarterback was heavily recruited and he's not getting as many looks as he should. And I think that's because he just didn't have a lot of targets his junior year. Yeah. Well, tight end, you know, like, especially you're, you're hundred percent right. The NFL, like plus the goal line, those guys score touchdowns because they utilize, sneak them out. Um, you know, when they run the ball on the goal line and they, and these guys score like five or six every single year. And those guys are valuable because they got to be able to uh, got to be able to be a great blocker in order to be able to sell that. So, um, well, the other thing I'm noticing in the promo, and I've talked to you know a bunch of people about this, is that there's so many companies out there doing this, and and this is similar to the camp business. As you remember, you know, when you started camps, it was Nike and then nothing else. Um, there were no underclassmen camps, and Nike really didn't invite underclassmen. You know, so you found something that nobody else was doing. Um, and then everybody started getting in the camp business, including my old company, uh, Under Armour, you know, Adidas, on and on. But not just them, like smaller companies. And then the seven on seven space became overcrowded. And you didn't know who was legit and who wasn't. You know, should I go to this seven on seven tournament? Uh, you know, it's, it's all based on reputation and it's all based on, you know, um, word of mouth. <clears throat> so people know us just because of our names, but there's so much other garbage out there that I think everybody's hesitant to pull the trigger on anything. anything. And, you know, when I see the promo program, you know, helping a, a Carson Kruger get a Drake offer and, and get a commitment, and now he's going to have his college paid for, uh, <clears throat> or I see a kid like Gavin Marshallek, who's was a third string quarterback heading into this season, and now he's the starter uh, on varsity. Uh, the success is there, but I think people are just really confused <clears throat> as to who to trust and, and who to, you know, double down with. So it, building trust in people is going to be the key here. Um, I thought it was going to be, hey, everybody knows who we are. Um, they should trust us. 
But this industry has been inundated with a bunch of um, untrustworthy people. And so that's something that, that we have to overcome when it comes to the promo program is don't put your money in the wrong place is all I'm saying. Yeah, it, it, it's a situation where, look, the bottom line is what's great is you, you see what you're getting, you know what you're getting. Um, but you're right. I do get do you do get questions of people, and when they're when they're putting their money, like it, it, they they have. I tell them, do your research. You know what I mean? Do your research. Like that's an important thing. If you're not sure, do your research. I'm glad to answer any questions you have, but you should do your own research. Like you're not gonna find anybody uh, in the industry with this kind of clout. Um, that's, that's working with you. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's Bob, there are other people with clout in this industry. Uh, and I would say they're coaching in division one colleges. So, um, unfortunately those guys are not going to be able to help you in the way that you need to, but there's very few, and there might be a handful around the country, um, that are able to do something, but very few and, uh, and not combining in the way that we are to do something. So. That stuff, but people, people, you know, in today's social media marketplace, they don't understand, you know, uh, how much impact does this have? There's so much stuff out there, and um, showing them the not just the people following them, but the depth and the breadth uh, of, of the reputation is, is important. But they got to talk to you still. That's the bottom line, and we're glad to talk, talk to you and, and communicate with you to be able to help you understand everything. So, you know, we welcome that. Um, you know, some of it's, some people are easy uh, with the process and then some people it takes time and that's okay. Um, but what, what you see, what actually starts to happen, uh, that, that's the results. And, you know, so check it out. Myfootballcamps.com says D1. Literally it's, uh, I, I think it's changed a lot of uh, a athletes trajectory in a really positive direction. Check it out. You can obviously always ask questions. You and Mike. Well, the best part about it is, I, you know, in doing this, I was a little hesitant just because of my experience with parents over the years. Um, you know, when you deal with parents e even more than I do running camps and stuff, but I was worried, you know, that I'd run into difficult people and I haven't run into anybody who's difficult. I haven't had one complaint and everybody's happy. And that's right. very rare, you know, and, and when you're ranking kids like I did forever, nobody's happy. Um, when you're selecting all-star, you know, five-star challenge kids and you got 104 roster spots, um, you know, 104 kids are going to be happy and everybody else can <laughs> pissed at you and on and on it goes. Uh, so this is a little bit different because this is just everybody rowing in the same direction, nobody being left out. You know, if you want us to pay attention to you, uh, there's a cost, it's life, but we're all in when we do. Um, and that's the cool part about it is, you know, I was talking to, you know, Marshall X father yesterday and I told him, I, said, I, I was surprised, you know, I love writing. I love opinions. I love, and we're going to get into the Jermaine Burton, Tennessee situation and Quinn Ewers. And I love writing stuff. I love running a website. I love people reading what I have to say. I love arguing with people about stuff. And I didn't think I'd like this as much, but this is a big part of it. It's, it's kind of fun for me. Um, and I keep saying that over and over again, but I don't think people understand what 24 years of dealing with, you know, parents of kids who are under recruited as a being told as a company that they're a nuisance, go away, ignore them um, to the point now where it's just a complete 180 where I'm actually dealing with them. Um, I don't know, it's refreshing. I, I, I've covered five stars. You know, I, I, Terrell Pryor and the great kid and Jadavian Clowney and, you know, uh, Bryce Brown, all those guys. But it's a different perspective. There's almost like a, a rich people's problems. Five stars have what I call rich people problems. Like, oh, my God, what, what school do I choose? I've got 58 offers. I'm so confused. And then there's kids who just die for an FCS offer. And that's a completely different problem. And I kind of like this end of it, too, after dealing with, um, you know, all the superstars for all those years. Absolutely. One hundred percent. I mean, I think it's a big thing. And uh, check out myfootballcamps.com slash D1. Um, Mike's social media right down below. You can see it right here. 
Uh, mine as well, at Coach Schumann at Empire Sports. And we have our, our websites. You can follow us. Um, make sure, you know, if you have a question, you think you're interested, but you, don't be shy. DM us. I'm glad to interact with you, answer your questions for you, okay? And uh, that's an important thing because sometimes people are shy and they, they don't want to ask questions. I don't get shy. I don't. Uh, people haven't been shy with me ever. Mm. I would prefer shy sometimes. Mm. Uh, I don't get shy. You get shy. I get shy sometimes. Yeah. Do you? I, I get. get I, I get, get a lot of links. Can you I check get DVD out? thrown at my freaking head? That's what I get. So I'm used to the opposite. Right. They like to attack you. Well, they like to you know put themselves on my windshield as I'm trying to drive away from a camp. That's the the opposite of shy. I think. Uh, uh, but so let's talk uh, Jermaine Burton before we get into your Quinn Ewers questions. Um, yeah. I did a, a, a just a just a very <laughs> low key video on this, on my opinion, on Jermaine Burton. So just to recap, Jermaine Burton's a wide receiver for Alabama. Alabama lost to Tennessee. Uh, the crowd, you know, fans rushed the field. It was chaos, and a video surfaced of you got to be kidding me of Jermaine Burton sort of pushing a girl in the face. You could say slap, push. I, I'll show it uh, in a sec. Okay, I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it's there's not a lot here. I mean, this isn't the Ray Rice, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna violent, scary situation. But to me, the the what I just said is in the video, I said – Nick Saban didn't suspend him at all. He played this past weekend against Mississippi State. I just think you have to send a message in this day and age uh, where we're aware of everything. Um, you have to suspend him for a game, you know, and Saban didn't do it. And you remember Musha Muhammad? Yes. Wide receiver for the Carolina Panthers. Yeah. So he was at Michigan State 100 years ago when Saban was there and he got in trouble legally. Um, he had got busted for marijuana, which now is nothing. And then, then he, he broke his probation and Saban didn't suspend him either. And Saban's, you know, explanation was he did, you know, he didn't feel it was warranted. And the guy turned out to be a great player, great human being. So people are sort of saying, you know, Saban knows, but I think it just looks like when at all costs. And I think they should have done something. Right, let me, uh, let me play oh, it. Let's play there. it. All right, you can see it, right? Okay, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll play it here. I just took the music out. So there he is, number number three. Yep, number three. I think there's a better version of this. So they're, they're playing it over and over again, though. She's in front of them. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So, I mean, she's I videoing him too. No, I think she was videoing the the scene, and I think he tried to knock her cell phone out. <clears throat> that's, that's and great. then he then he he acts okay. Here's the so there's this there's this the the screen grab of it. It's it's not a punch. It's not a she goes to the side of and and the, and he, the acts part, the, he hits her in the face. Kind of is that what happened? Yeah, so you see her holding her face and turning around and looking at him, kind of stunned. She wasn't hurt. She didn't right. press charges. This isn't you know this isn't Ray Rice. It's just. It's just something that you can't do. So, yeah, if you're on the field and the, and the crowd, you know, rushes the field and it's very difficult to get off the field and, you know, you're going to interact with people, but you just got to get off the field. You got to just get off the field, not touch anybody Did and try to anything to him. I don't know. See, that's the thing that hasn't come out. So Jermaine is not commented. I, I, I wouldn't have hired him either, but I, I texted him to see if I could get just sort of a, you know, his side of things. He didn't respond. I think he changed his number. Um, you know, but Saban said that, that Jermaine told him that he was scared and you know, that was the reason he did it, but he doesn't, I don't, I don't think it's, that. it's not a scared thing. Um, but my point was Saban really needs to just suspend him for one game. I don't think his football career should be ruined. I don't think you do any of that stuff. Even suspend him. You can't suspend him for a half because a half is just like really, really, throwing it in the face of, I don't think this kid should be suspended, but I'm going to do it anyways just to shut everybody up. But maybe missing a game would have been the right message. Doing nothing? 
I, I think it speaks to Saban's bulletproof nature. He's the best coach to ever live, and, and nobody can mess with him. And also his his win at all costs type of mentality. And I'm not being overly critical of Jermaine Burton in this situation. He shouldn't have done it. But like I said, it, it wasn't egregiously horrible. And I'm not overly, you know, critical of Nick Saban here. My video was very low key. It's like, you know what? Come on. It, it, throw him a one game suspension. Everybody learns from the situation. He won't do it again. And then move on. But Saban didn't do that. So now we got a topic. Did he handle anything internally at all? I'm sure he did. I'm sure he talked to him. The, the kid's taking anger management classes because he's blown up a couple other times in different situations. Um, it was brought up on the telecast. I think it was uh, Fowler, Chris Fowler, and, and a couple other people were talking about it. You know, and they came under scrutiny for the way they talked about it um, because they weren't really doubling down on the fact that his career should be over or whatever. And all the outraged people in this world want ruination. They want Jermaine Burton to never play football again. Well, that's and his life to be destroyed. But that's how social media is. Um, so in the opposite, where they just mentioned that he was taking anger management classes and they didn't, they didn't condone, nor did they really – uh, be, become critical of Saban's punishment. They're they're under fire too, and they're not in trouble. It's just this is the way it is. So if you, I look at situations are you have to win, right? You, you have to you have to win in the eye of the public. Um, who was the coach? Remember the coach that was just fired at Oklahoma before the season started for for use of a racial slur. He was, he was, he grabbed somebody's phone and he was reading. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And we, you and I had our different, and we talked about how stupid it was. And then it came out that he repeated it. You know, I thought it was a one-time thing. You read it and then like, Oh, I shouldn't have said that. And then, but he repeated it over and over again. So yeah. he should be fired because that's just utter stupidity, but he's an adult. Jermaine Burton's a kid. I don't think he should be, you know, kicked off the team or anything like that. But Nick Saban's an adult, and he understands, listen, if I suspend this kid for a game, maybe I'll shut some people up. We're still going to beat Mississippi State because they own Mississippi State. That's a win-win for everybody. But by not suspending him, it's like Saban's just defiantly saying, I don't give a crap what you think. I'm going to do what I want. And he can, but now we're talking about it, and we wouldn't be talking about it if the kid missed a game, I think. Um, well, I think you would be talking about it. I don't know. I, I think uh, there's two sides of it. The people who hate Alabama um, are not happy. The people who love Alabama don't care. Um, and I do think this. So something should have happened for what he did. I, I don't know exactly. It's, a, it's such a tough angle to see exactly like how hard he hit her. Uh, what hard to know what the intent was. I don't know what the woman said. Um, like not not what she said to him, but like what she said happened. Or do you know on that? Yeah, she shut down her social media. She did. She did not press charges, and she hasn't been heard from, to my knowledge. Right. So that makes it awful difficult. But I I think you know I uh, if if it had happened where no one saw it, like let's say the olden days. Okay, and someone brought it to their attention. They probably would have just had a talking to. That's my guess. Because social media, and you could see what somebody actually does. That makes it a little bit different. What is the action on it? Um, Nick Saban gave whatever his explanation is. I, I I think what the issue is with Nick Saban is this. Okay, and this, uh, and you tell me what you think about it. He had that tirade, which I agreed with about how nobody helped Henry Ruggs. Nobody told Henry Ruggs not to get into a car and all this other stuff and leadership about leadership. It was one of my favorite rants by his, you know, at the, in a positive way, like, yeah, I agree with you. But here is his opportunity to be a leader in some way, shape, or form. And I don't know, like, like does he learn from this, uh, you know, what is the situation here? No one said, you know, he's a big second chance guy, and I get that. But no one said, I don't think anyone's suggesting 
at least from my side or your side, that he should uh, be gone. I think, you know, some something should have happened here, some form of suspension. I don't know what it is. I mean, um, you know, I disagree in a sense that I think these sometimes are things that you do do the half half suspension, half half a, a game suspension. I do know what you're saying. Like everyone knows the half game suspension is basically a BS suspension. Complete BS. Yeah, complete BS suspension. So does that teach anything? I don't know. Um, and I don't know anything about Burton. Beyond, you know more than I do about his <clears throat> past yeah. history stuff. Nice, nice kid. I mean, so, uh, a California kid went to Georgia. Every every experience I've had with him from recruiting to the portal, because he was at Georgia when he won the national championship last year, transferred to Alabama. Nice kid. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I thought Aaron Hernandez was a nice kid. <laughs> I really did. I, I just had a every, heart attack. Every, yeah. Well, I'm saying every experience I had with Aaron Hernandez was a great one. He's a local kid from Connecticut. Oh, <clears> his <throat> brother is a great guy. Okay, Ooh. so he's a college coach. Well, was a college coach. I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. DJ. Yeah, so Aaron Hernandez, I had I had lunch with, I had breakfast with, because um, he was a local kid. I, I went to a lot of his games and stuff like that. I covered him very closely in the recruiting process because we don't get – you know, borderline five-star, you know, tight end wide receivers in Connecticut. And his story was intriguing because he was going to go to UConn. His father died. Then he went to Florida and on and on. But I thought he was a nice kid. Now, people say he was in gangs in Bristol. I, I don't really know whether he was or wasn't. I, I don't know anything. But I'm saying, like, I don't know Jermaine Burton. He could be a freaking serial killer. I don't know. How do I know? You would never know. Was My experience with him has been great. He's always been Mr. Polite, you know, to me, Mr. Farrell, blah, blah, blah. You know, so so that's even when I prefaced the video. I said, it's always been nice to me, but but everybody's nice to me. I mean, because they want something. So I don't know what type of kid he is. Except Northeast coaches, which is what you said. Uh... <laughs> Except well, those guys. They don't want they're just, well, they're all they're all cry. I'm talking kids. Northeast coaches. I'm just joking. Them. I'm teasing. Yeah, I know, but they, they're all crotchy. Um, not recruits. Recruits want something from me, whether Absolutely. it's attention, ranking, or whatever. Right. You know, but portal kids don't. Honestly, that what I've noticed in the portal is they don't want to talk to you. They don't want to be a part of you. They, they, there's a shame level of being in the portal, or an embarrassment level of leaving your team, or whatever. And they don't want. To, and they, they're older now, and they don't want to talk like they did when they were recruited. And Burton was fine. You know, every every correspondence was fine. He never really. But whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know the kid. Listen, this is – and this is the world we live in too. I mean, 20 years ago, obviously, this would not have come out. There wouldn't be phones with cameras and, you know, all this other stuff that – now everything you do is watched. Everything that happens could be on video. you got to be careful. So shame on Bert, Jermaine Burton for even raising his hand, but also shame on Nick Saban for, you know, just – even if the kid, even if even I would sit the kid down, and I'm not a coach, I'd say, listen, Jermaine, between me and you, you know, this wasn't an egregious offense, okay? And, and you may say you were scared. I don't know if you were or weren't. I know that situation was crazy. You know, you got 100,000 fans rushing the field. I said, but what you did is unacceptable in society, and I'm going to suspend you for a game because of it. And that's right. the end of it. And he wouldn't. I don't I think, think he your point is valid. I think he your point is valid. You know, it looks like he hit a woman. I, I, I see the whole thing. It looks like he, like, like he, like, kind of slapped a woman. Um, you, it is taken. Maybe it's after a game, so it's like a. Uh, 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 it was kind of like a half. It wasn't like a like a slap, like you know, a man and a woman are an argument, like domestic violence slap. Um, but it was, it was some version of that. And yeah, I, I agree. The re and that's why I brought up the Henry Ruggs thing. If Saban is about teaching lessons to young men, right. And being a leader, then this is what we would call a leadership moment. And so who are you, Nick Saban to me? Like, look, he chastises, and I love him as a coach. I mean, I think he's an unbelievable coach. Obviously, people say he's the best of all time, you know, 
maybe he's the best recruiter of all time, but whatever it is, okay? And but chastises, you know, guys like Jimbo Fisher, for example. For you know, he he, he there's no doubt that he thinks he is among the morality in the morality pr- police world. He's the highest of them, you know, in, in that, and everybody else is below him. So if that's the case, if that's the case, then if you're teaching leadership lessons, then where is the leadership lesson here? Okay, for Jermaine Burton. And it, it it's it's not that it's exactly what you said. It's not that it was overly egregious offense. You can't hit a woman no matter what it is. Okay. Now look, if she hauled up and smacked him, then that's a different situation. She didn't do that. Nope. So if she said something to you, which we don't know, if right. she said something to you, like, I mean, literally, you could turn around and say something back. No one's going to say anything about that, right? And keep walking. So uh, so that part is like, um, but if you haul up and hit somebody, and let's say the worst case scenario, she said some nonsense to him, which I don't think, but but let's say she said some nonsense to him. It does still doesn't warrant smacking smacking her. No, no. And Joe Mixon is a good example here too. Like, you know, Joe Mixon was on video, uh, absolutely cold cocking that girl, knocking her out. Um, But she had used a racial slur, and there were multiple witnesses to that. Um, So that's a trickier situation. But even then, you can't punch her. You can't knock her out. And he got suspended for a year. And I was critical of Bob Stoops at the time, too, because I think Joe Mixon, that should have been career ending. Um, and it wasn't. And Mixon, you know, <laughs> has gone on to the NFL and had success and blah, blah, blah. And I think Bob Stoops had a sort of win at all men- win at all cost mentality as well with him. Jimbo Fisher with Jameis Winston and the accusations against him at Florida State. Um, <sighs> on and on, we're seeing examples of this. So it's not just Nick Saban. Um, and and those are much more egregious accusations or offenses than this. But for me, just just slap a one game on them and get this over with, you know. And, and not to, because that's how light this is. I mean, really, there's nothing here, except nothing. except for a message to them and say, just keep your hands to yourself. That's it. <sighs> and I'm gonna make you miss a game because of it. So. We can get to yours now. I mean, because that's it, an interesting topic to yeah, me, yeah, yeah. you know, but it's Sweet. a lot to do about nothing, I guess. Yeah. yeah, no, I just think it's it's a chance for him to, you know, but maybe he thinks he, I, you know, I, I don't know the man. So, you know, I, I just think like I, I've, I've loved a lot of his stuff. Uh, literally, I agree with a lot of things he said. And then sometimes the actions don't match it. And then just like, is this just because you're in a bad mood and you wanted to rant on this, or you know, right. or, or or in Rugs' case, he loves Rugs, right? And he feels like you know, ah, uh, you know, like uh, so much. But but then you're not consistent with things. So if something happens to Jermaine Burton down the line, that's not good, right? Um, and he, you know, I don't know, misbehaves in some way, which way, shape, or form. Then you would argue, whose leadership fault was that? Maybe you could right. argue that was yours. You had the opportunity to help a kid who is going to have a chance to be a pro and all that kind of jazz, uh, <clears throat> get on the, get, get, you know, to be successful and, you know, especially, but it is here, here or there. I mean, um, it'll probably die in a week and with the news, uh, how the cycle is probably a couple of days, a couple of days. Um, okay. so Quinn Ubers, here, here, here's what I thought was, I watched the whole game. Because I thought it was a great match. First of all, I, it, it, it is nice to have Texas at least playing pretty well because right. it I enjoy watching them when they're playing pretty well. It makes it fun, the matchups, right? And Gundy is a hell of a coach, um, has done amazing – I mean, look, it certainly helped when the, the, the billionaire gave some money to really help him be able to recruit at least on par in a Big 12. I'm not saying he could recruit on par – nationally but at least with the big 12 he's, he's better um but what i watch watching quinn ewers and i you know when he was in high school i used to love all the wild throws he'd had and the mullet i saw him and like you know quick release and everything and even though he threw a little three-quarter-ish to me a little three-quarter-ish i think he did that on purpose i really do 
I don't think that's his natural release. I think he he was a kid who was enamored with off platform because of Mahomes. So, you know, that's that's yeah. what I see there. So watching this game, I then watched passes. Now I'm not just talking about the three interceptions. Three interceptions, one of them was a receiver drop, yep. the other two were bad. And um and then there was another one that was a pick six that they had gone off sides. It would have been a pick six. It would have ended the game one play earlier. He threw another one the next play. Okay. But what what I thought was worse was some of these lollipop throws into the sands, inaccurate throws down the field, wildly inaccurate at times. And almost a casual style of throwing. Like he's just kind of throwing it, throwing it to throw. I don't know. Like sometimes you see this in high school, like a high school kid just throws the throw. So I said, let me go back and see if there is anything like this in high school. And there is. So that's what surprised me. I just went through Twitter and started typing in Quinn Ewers and INT. And I saw things like in the championship game, one of the championship games, he kind of just started firing a ball around. And, um, uh, and I don't know if it's something when he gets out of sync, that's kind of how he maneuvers it. Or is this going to be an issue? Like when, so it looked like teams got pressure in him in high school. Okay. He started to like get rid of it because he has that quick release and he can get rid of the ball fast and throws it out of there and was turning into picks and bat wildly inaccurate throws. A couple times it happened in the in the high school level. Now, obviously, they're wildly better than most of the teams they played. So it wasn't until they got to the top, top level competition games that it ever had a chance of happening. But it did happen a few times. And it was when people got a lot of pressure. And that's what I noticed Oklahoma State did. They got a lot of pressure on him, and the throws were wildly inaccurate. And um, I wonder – now, look, he's young. Can this stuff be corrected? But the, the question everyone automatically goes to is, if he isn't that good for Texas, it's not the end, end of the world because they have someone come in that will take his place. But for Quinn Ewers himself – um, it, is there something there when he gets a lot of pressure? Does he not get enough into it? And is his arm weaker to me? Because I noticed that, like, he's got a really quick release, good arm, ball pops out fast when he's in position. But if he's, like, somewhat off balance, he struggles to throw the football. Well, your thoughts? He doesn't finish his throws. Yes. When he's under pressure. So, when you see him stand in there and his footwork's good and he has time and he steps into his throws, he finishes his throws and the ball is a, it's a bullet. He's got one of the best arms that you're going to see and he can make any throw. Um, I was watching the NFL yesterday and I was watching the Jaguars for whatever reason. And I was watching Trevor Lawrence and just watching the way the ball comes out and how quick it gets to where it needs to be and how magical it is when he has time and he steps into his throws. Um, Quinn Ewers is young, and his bad habit right now is when he is under pressure, he doesn't finish his throws. And by that, I mean he he his delivery stops, and that's when the ball floats. So on the on the sideline interception, the first you know the first interception went right through the guy's hands. It was a good pass. It, it was tipped up interception. That Second was the end of the game. That was the end of the game. Oh, it was the end of the game. That's right. That's right. And then. <laughs> So the, 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 the other interception looked like a miscommunication a little bit between him and the receiver. Receiver was coming inside. You were through it to the outside. But it was also a bad throw. It was a very, very poor throw under duress. But it wasn't one of those half arm. It's the one, the lob on the sidelines where the ball floated, where you could just see he's under pressure. He's not going to finish his throw. He's not able to step in the throw. He throws off his back foot, and he just lets it float. Those are the decisions that he needs to really change. Um, he's had one bad game. You know, I mean, the Alabama game was a good game, but he got hurt. You know, he had four touchdowns, one pick against Oklahoma, no picks against Iowa State. But his numbers, 11 TDs, five interceptions, speak to somebody who tries to do too much with their arm, but that's not him. I've seen guys like with cannon arms. Jeff George is probably the best example of this. Great arm, and they try to – Brett Favre, too. They try to fit the ball in where they can't because they think their arm is just so reliable to them. 
that they can do things with it that nobody else can. And they throw a lot of picks because of it. This is a mechanical issue that needs to be fixed. So you're right. Um, it's not an arm strength issue. It's he seems not to not be able to shift his weight. So it seems like he does like when he's back here, um, and he he go and he's in trouble. He's not sh shifting his weight. You're not able to step into the throw when you have blitzes. Like, but no, he's but not he's shifting throwing, any weight. Yeah, he's throwing backwards, and, like, and he's like this. Yeah, he's like it's like a jump shot. The right. only way you can say it's like a fadeaway yeah, like jump a fade away. shot. Yeah, fadeaway. And, and so that is obviously something that they need to work on and correct because that will lead to an intercept interception quite often. Because the ball is always going to float. A, a fadeaway jump shot is going to be high arcing and float, and that's exactly what he does. Now, you know, I the interceptions didn't concern me as much, except for that one. You know, the, the floating one on this on the side. But you know, yeah, you're right. I mean, the one that sealed the game went right through the guy's hands. The other one was a miscommunication, I think, but also a bad throw. It's the level of incompletions. I mean, 19 for 49. That's hard to do. It's really hard to be that inaccurate. Um, you know, the minimum you accept is 50% uh, for a quarterback, and you want 72%. So for him to come in at that percentage, that's very alarming to me, and that's probably why part of why they lost the game. When you – when you so I looked at, like, some of the – I don't remember what state championship game they lost. Might have been a junior year or sophomore. I can't remember. The other quarterback was like set eighty percent or something, and he was like fifty one percent with multiple picks. And I saw the same same act. They they showed highlights of it, and it was like the same thing. It was the same jump shot type stuff. And his incompletions. Just having watched the whole game, his incompletions were under prep. Most a lot of times was like I said, he's able to get rid of the ball when you pressure him. OK, like a lot of guys end up getting sacked, right? He doesn't get sacked per se unless, you know, you just come clean. He's actually able to get rid of it. But what happens is it's a jump shot. Right. And these things are floating out to the sideline. And it's just like every throw in this game, like when he when he did when they got pressure on him, when they went up, you're almost like, whoa, what's going to happen? And it, it, it was kind of wild. But you're right. It's it, it, obviously it's a flaw. It's something that it's actually to me maybe a habit that he's got to fix, because it, uh, even more than a flaw, right? It's like almost like has to be repped on how to throw with such tight space with a guy right on him. A product of someone who's won a million games in high school, uh, who never had a lot of pressure, in my opinion, right? Always was able to kind of step into his throw. Never really had a huge issue with that. Maybe a couple of games when they had had a championship or something yeah the, the other thing people have to remember about yours is that he accelerated um you know he didn't have a senior year right so he played his sophomore and junior year he accelerated to get to ohio state early mainly i think because of nil right uh, because the state of texas didn't allow you as a high school student to cash in and you know coming out early and going to ohio state you can make a ton of money so he's, he's technically one year removed from high school, so to speak, just like JT Daniels came out early. And it kind of stunts your development a little bit because you don't learn to fight through these things. Like he had 45 touchdowns and three picks his sophomore year, and then he got hurt, missed six games his junior year, 28 TDs, five picks. But you don't learn to work through things as quickly as you would if you don't have that extra year. Um, so I think, honestly, he's a very young quarterback with very little, little experience. When you look at, you know, Quinn Ewers, honestly, <laughs> this is a kid that's thrown 142 passes in college and essentially 142 passes since 2020. Um, that's not a lot of live football, you know? It's just, it's just not uh, it was since 2021, sorry, COVID year. So 2022 practice, you know, practice, practice, practice um, at that 2021. I mean, at Ohio state practice, practice, practice 2022 live action, you know, with an injury 
142 passes into his career, but his completion rate, rate is 57.7. It's not good. He was under 40%. So I, I think the criticism is warranted, but he's still working a lot of things out that, you know, we see a lot of quarterbacks trying to work out. DJ Uyunglele at – uh I uh, got pulled. Yeah, he got pulled, and, and Klubnik played, but Klubnik only threw two passes. And I think we get spoiled sometimes by the well, – Klubnik um, won the game. Did you see that one? Yeah, but he, he threw two passes. I'm saying that they, they came back. They scored 14 points. They were down. They were getting killed. I agree. I wrote, I, wrote, I, wrote, I wrote an article today, I think, that Clemson should make the change because the energy on that football team, it changed the second that dude got in the game. When when Klubler got in the game, they only let him throw twice. He ran here and there. Yes. But they pounded the ball at them. But the energy level of yeah. Syracuse – Changed. I watched that entire game. My buddy's a Syracuse fan. You know, he was excited. Use a map in your car. Oh, hold on. Why not use a map with your cards? They were up 21 to 10. Uh, DJ throws a second pick. They bring Klubnik in. He goes two for four for 19 yards. But the energy of, of everything about that on offense and defense changed, and they ended up, you know, scoring 17 straight points to win the football game. But I think we get spoiled a little bit by – the Trevor Lawrence is of the world who jump in as a true freshman and just dominate the world. Um, you know, Bryce Young needed a year under Mac Jones. Quinn Ewers is still brand new to college football, despite the fact that he had a year at Ohio state um, under Stroud last year. These are mistakes he's going to make and they have to work on them for sure. Um, but it doesn't worry me at all. I think he's the solution. I think Arch Manning's going to redshirt. And I think that's going to be the way things work. And I also will tell you this. I think Quinn Ewers, even if he has an average career, and Matt Stafford had, by and large, an average career at Georgia, okay? He didn't win a national championship. Uh, they didn't do as much as expected under Matt Stafford as, as you would think. Um, I'm looking up his stats right now. Get ready. Our most popular battery. What the hell, man? You, everything's autoplay. So he completed 57% of his passes, Matt Stafford. Um, you know, his first year he had seven TDs, 13 picks, then 19 TDs, 10 picks, 25 TDs, 10 picks. Not a great career. No. And he is Quinn Ewers. And I still think I'll tell you this. My prediction, the same style. yeah. My prediction for the 2024 draft is that Quinn Ewers will still be the number one pick in the draft. Huh. Well, if he fixes the things he needs to fix, I think that that would be the case. That's what I said about Matt Stafford, <laughs> you got to understand the NFL dudes get enamored with your physical skills. That's true. Matt That's Stafford, true. six three two ten. He threw 51 TDs and 33 interceptions and completed 57% of his passes. That's not True. good. None of that's good. And he's, he, amazing, he's amazing in the NFL. Right. And the, But he was a number one overall pick in the 2009 draft because his arm is golden. And, and he can do the things that you don't see guys with a lesser arm able to do. So Ewers will go through this season and next season – He'll go to the combine. He'll have his pro day. Everybody will rave about his pro day. Have right. you ever heard of a bad pro day, by the way, for a quarterback? No. But it's I've, it's the only a, thing I hear is better pro days versus yeah pro days. Right. But, I mean, yeah, we saw, I, you know, I remember the Justin Fields. Johnny Manziel had the greatest pro day. I remember that. Everybody like, has the greatest Oh, he's pro so day. great. Trey Lance had the greatest pro day until, you know, Mac Jones had a, had a bad pro day. And then he had a second pro day, and his pro day was great. You know, but that whole year is Justin Fields and Trey Lance and Zach Wilson all had the greatest pro days ever, ever. And I'm like, well, it's a pro day. All the, all the throws are scripted to receivers you know. You shouldn't – there shouldn't be an incompletion. There's no coverage. So, you know, he'll go and have a great pro day, and his arm will be amazing, and he'll be the number one pick in the draft in 2024, even if he doesn't fix these mistakes. Because – That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, the NFL, man, I'm telling you, they're just well, in it's, it's totally different games. Like, you can 
I, I think the Clemson guy is going to get drafted. I mean, he's six foot five. He's he, 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 second round at worst. Someone's still going to take him, right? I mean, he's six. He could throw five thousand picks. It, 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 you, how many six foot five guys that could sling it are you going to find? I mean, yeah. I mean, second round at worst. He's six foot five, two hundred thirty five pounds. He's got 17 TDs, four picks this year. He got yanked in that Syracuse game. Dabo's going to stick with him as the starter. He'll probably go undefeated this year because their schedule's not that bad at all moving forward. He'll be in the playoff, and he'll be likely a first-rounder. But if he slides into the second round, then that's where he'll go. Right. And, and he's, got a, he's got a lot of problems. Uh, there's a there's a lot because uh, again look he's six foot five he's obviously completely relied on physical dominance is you know as you talking about high school and stuff I mean I mean uh, you know a six foot five inch quarterback who moves moved in high school pretty well for college I don't think he moves that well but um, but he moved pretty well in height for high school and his size I mean there's just no there's no high school kids that can corral a kid like that. You won't know any flaws on that until he starts to get to college. Plus the college game is so different. Like these guys who really could scoot running wise, they, they have a significant bigger impact than the guys who just stand back there and throw. Now there are guys who stand back there and throw who light it up. I mean, obviously Mike Leach's teams always do that, you know, even right. Even you know that th that helps them win nine games every year, right? But but for the most part, if the guy's actually able to run and throw pretty well in college, they have a large level of effectiveness. But only the the Lamar Jacksons or the Kyler Murrays of the world can really have any effectiveness in the pros. Meaning they're so fast, right? Like you can't be like good speed, make a lot of people miss in college, and then in pros you're just average speed. When you're Kyler Murray or uh, Lamar Jackson, they're so much faster than everybody that they're still able to do it for a while. We'll see how long that happens, continues that, but for a while in the pros. Whereas everybody else, if you can't drop back and throw and sling it, I mean, you're going to be highly ineffective, you know? Yeah. And also, the system you come from is, it's, because you mentioned Mike Leach, and I remember Tim Couch talking about how unprepared he was for the NFL because he was under Mike Leach in Kentucky. Um, and, and, you know, that's a, that's a offensive system. That's not going to prepare you at all for the NFL. And Mike Leach doesn't produce NFL quarterbacks as a result of it, but Clemson, you know, they got a new offensive coordinator this se season, but the, the system itself, Deshaun Watson to Trevor Lawrence, he'll get a break because of that as well, because it's conducive on a lot of progressions and reads and things like that. Um, it's funny watching that game because Garrett Schrader, who comes from a Mike Leach offense, First look, if it's not there, run. There's no progressions. And it was getting frustrating because I was kind of rooting for Syracuse because they're the underdog. And I'm just like, they couldn't figure out in the first half. And then they went in at halftime, made an adjustment. And they're like, this dude locks. And if he doesn't lock, he's running. So get ready. So if he doesn't throw on his first read, he's going to run, get him. And they did. Whereas, you know, the Clemson offense is a little bit more sophisticated. So, He'll get that bump too. Um, it's you know you got C.J. Stroud, you got Bryce Young, you got Will Levis. Um, you know you, you got a bunch of quarterbacks this year, uh, so I think he's probably second round. But there'll probably be five taken in the first round because last year there was one taken in the first two rounds. It's crazy. I believe the first two rounds. Can he pick it? Was it picking you know? the only one taken? Yeah, I think I saw that last night. I should remember this, but the, you know when the, when the draft's over, I focus on the next year. But, yeah, when I was watching the game last night, they said that Pickett was the only quarterback taken in the first two rounds, which is unbelievably rare. So that means that people are going to overload on quarterbacks next year, and DJ will be a second-round pick at worst. But we should probably wrap it up because it's 1 o'clock. Yes, sir. Um, I got other shows to do and stuff like that. So go to myfootballcamps.com slash D1. Um, DM us. I'm at M. Farrell Sports. Uh Coaches at Coach Schumann uh, on Twitter or on Instagram or on TikTok, we're everywhere. Um, ask us questions if you have questions about it. Um, you know, we're going to help people. It's just whether they choose to to put the investment together. You know, I was talking to you last. Was it last week? You or no? This was just a, a conversation with you about 
you know, your kid, if you, when your kid becomes eligible and if he needs attention, you know, he's too young now, you would absolutely 100% invest this. A for, the, a, for the happiness of your child, B, for doing it as a parent and, and trying to give them every opportunity to fulfill their dreams, and C, because it's effective and it can work. Um, so that's, I think if you do it, you're going to be happy with the results. Um, but it just takes, I know it takes a little while to, to get comfortable with doing it. Because a lot of the people that you've noticed that have come to us have already invested in other programs. Yes, I noticed that. And they're a little jaded. Like, oh, I worked with this program and it was awful and a waste of money. You know, and money's difficult now. I mean, inflation's insane. Um, yep. You don't have a ton of money to invest. And so if you've already sunk money into something that's not going to work, you may not have the money to sink it into something else. So, you know, I'm hoping the more we promote it, the more people will look at us first rather than waste their money elsewhere. Yep. Um, because that's the other thing I think we're trying to overcome here. We're new to the market, um, you know, and, and we might have been like your second or third uh, option. And by then, you don't have any money left. So anyhow, it's, it's fun to do for us uh, and we'll, we'll get you some, some promotion. So myfootballcamps.com slash D1. I will talk to you. We got a call tomorrow. Yep. So I'll set it up. And then we'll we'll talk tomorrow. You got it. Great podcast. Great great debate. We'll we'll see you soon, and uh, we'll hit the uh, outro here and get going. Have a great day. <laughs>